consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. On this episode of the What is Asia podcast, I interview Kirk Larson, an associate professor of history at Brigham Young University, to talk about his book, Tradition, Treaties, and Trade, Qing Imperialism and Chosong Korea, 1850 to 1910. Dr. Larson, thanks for coming on this episode of the What is Asia podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So your book is titled Tradition, Treaties, and Trade, Qing Imperialism in Chosong, Korea, 1850 to 1910. There's a lot going on in this title. Can you just start by describing for the audience what it is that you're arguing in this book? and provide a bit of historical context for those in our audience who aren't too familiar with this period of Chinese and or Korean history. Sure. So as the title indicates, uh, this book explores relations between the Qing Empire, uh, often which we just simply call China, and uh, the Joseon Kingdom, which we might call Korea, uh, during this really important period, the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, This is a time when both China and Korea were subjected to increasing pressure from the outside world, uh, the Western imperialist powers, but also increasingly Japan. And ultimately uh, those powers kind of prevailed over both the Qing and Joseon Korea. Joseon Korea is annexed by Japan in 1910. The Qing falls in 1912. And not only do those two polities cease to exist, but many would argue that the entire traditional political order ceases to exist at this point. imperial China with with an emperor at the top, uh, the use of Confucian civil service exams as a major means of recruiting officials, similarly in Korea with a monarch at the top and also using Confucian civil service exams and a host of other things. All that sort of comes to an end in 1910, 1912, and both places start to become more modern, if you will. Uh, And so within that context, uh, if, if we try to understand what the Qing was doing in Korea, Earlier depictions usually depict the Qing as the latest in a string of Chinese dynasties that was trying to desperately to cling to its traditional style of relations with Korea, uh, which are which are often called tributary relations. Uh, but such pre-modern relics simply couldn't last in an age of modernity, and so they have to give way to modern Western style uh, Westphalian relations and modern imperialism. Uh, What I argue in the book, though, is that if you don't necessarily look as much at what Qing officials were saying they were doing, but look at what they actually do on the ground in Korea, it's really hard to distinguish what the Qing was doing in Korea in, say, the 1870s, 80s, 90s, up to 1910, and what all these other supposedly modern imperialist powers were doing across Asia at the same time. Uh, They were utilizing unequal treaties. They were carving out self-governing concessions in treaty ports. They were asserting extraterritoriality. They were uh, helping Korea construct key infrastructure, uh, modern telecommunications like telegraph lines. They were uh, using gunboats and troops to assert their power. Uh, All these types of things, when when it happens in China at the same time, uh, Chinese historians say that's imperialism. Uh, And my my core argument is that's exactly what the Qing was doing in and to Korea at the exact same time. Uh, I would argue this matters because it helps bring the Qing Empire, China, back into the mainstream of world history. That that China is not this exception that, uh, unlike every other great power of the time, wasn't an imperialist power. It it too was one, Uh, even though at the same time it was also a victim of, of Western imperialism. And so it allows us uh, to, to compare what was going on in China with, uh, with other parts of the world and see a lot more commonalities and similarities than we used to think. So you note in your book that there was a lot of debate during this time in China about whether or not the Qing should just outright annex Chosong Korea. Can you elaborate a bit more on what specifically that debate looked like and explain why, as you talk about the Qing ultimately decided not to annex Korea, instead leaving their hierarchical hierarchical relationship to Korea a a bit more ambiguous than just outright control. So within the Qing at the time, uh, there were a number of different 
uh, groups that had different foreign policy orientations and priorities. And among them was a group that sometimes we call in English the purist party or the Qing Niu Dan. Uh, and these are a group of uh, devoted Confucian officials that, that uh, wanted to keep things traditional, or at least their, their idea of what, what tradition was. But ironically, even though we often label them conservative, they also were in many cases very radical in terms of their foreign policy. And this was definitely the case you know, when it came to Korea, that you had Qing Niu officials like uh, Zhang Jian or uh, Zhang Pei Lun saying, uh, you know, Korea is in trouble. It's being threatened by these outside powers. Let's just annex the place. Let's just make Korea another province, uh, just like Shandong or, or, or Zhejiang. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, the reason why this didn't happen is because the chief uh, statesman uh, architect of, of the Qing's policies in Northeast Asia, Li Hongzhang, uh, basically said, we can't do this. Uh, this will likely trigger a war with Russia or Japan or the West or all three. We're not in a state to fight this war. Uh, we need to resort to less intrusive measures to try to safeguard our interests there. Uh, and Lee eventually carries the day in, in the debates in, in, in the Qing court. And so despite the fact that you had some saying, yes, we, we need to annex Korea, uh, it, 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 in the end of the day, there's no formal attempt to, to make that happen. So in your book, you talk about this robust debate among China scholars, which still turns to this very day. Was Qing China a colonial power? You make the case that much of the Qing's activities in Korea from 1850 to 1910 were in fact colonial in nature and assert that the same can be said about other parts of Asia that China had an interest in incorporating into their political domain. While I'm personally inclined to agree with your assessment, some would still disagree with your description of China as a colonial power. Could you just start with describing for the audience in simplest terms the difference between colonialism and imperialism, and then explain why you would describe the Qing as being a colonial power? Okay, uh, that, that gets us into a, an impossible thicket of, of uh, conceptual and historiographical debates. And the fact of the matter is imperialism and colonialism have been used in so many different senses in so many different ways that I despair at ever being able to draw a bright line distinction between the two that, that everyone would accept and agree. Uh, for some, colonialism might be a subset of imperialism that requires settlers, that requires people to leave the metropole and go to the colony and live there. But that's only sort of one narrow definition of it. And, and obviously the term colonialism has been used in many other contexts far removed from that. And so uh, I, I don't necessarily make a distinction between imperialism and colonialism. But what I do do is make a distinction between formal empire, where the lines on the map change, where, where uh, the, the metropole is asserting direct territorial jurisdiction and control over a new territory of people, um, and informal imperialism, where there still is an indigenous government and it still exercises a great deal of power and sovereignty over its own people, but it is not allowed to necessarily dictate the terms of its engagement with the outside world. And I think you can make an argument that what Qing China, the Qing empire experienced in the 19th century was for the most part, Western informal imperialism. You know, very little territory was annexed with the exception of Hong Kong after the Opium War and Taiwan after the, the Sino-Japanese War. Throughout the entirety of the 19th century, the, you know, the rest of the territory more or less remains under Qing control. But no one in China is gonna say there was no imperialism therefore during this time. They'd say, no, look at all these humiliating things the Westerners did to us. They, force us to sign unequal treaties. They have these treaty ports. They have rule themselves within them. Uh, they meddle with our tariff rates. They meddle with our finances. They do all these other things. Uh, and, and, and so that's imperialism, even if it's not a direct assertion of formal control. Uh, may argue that the capitulations in the Ottoman Empire are a similar case of, of you know, informal imperialism. And so I think that that's a good lens with which to understand what the Qing ends up doing in Korea not doing what the Qing no Dong, the, the, the purist party wanted and directly annex it, but asserting a lot of control over certain aspects, especially how Korea interacted with the outside world. Um, I would note though that uh, I, I'm firmly within the sort of new Qing history camp in, in the sense that I think we, we need to regard the Qing as an empire and, and recognize that the Qing did many things that other empires of the day did, whether it's uh, utilizing cutting edge cartography in the 17th century or gunboats in the 19th century, uh, 
doing things that other empires did. And the PRC today doesn't really want to talk about the Qing in these terms. Uh, the PRC generally prefers terms like national unification or border affairs rather than colonialism or imperialism. But I think, again, if, if, if you just sort of look at it comparatively, the similarities between what the Qing was doing during this time and what other imperialist powers are doing are quite striking. So one point that I found striking in your book is that in the first couple of pages, you describe this big gunboat coming off the coast of Korea. And of course, the first thought that's going to come to everyone's minds is that this must be a Western power encroaching on Korea's territory. But then you reveal in the following pages that it's actually a Chinese gunboat. It's striking because this description of a Chinese gun gunboat off the coast of uh, Korea is resonant with the imagery of Western colonial powers employing gunboat diplomacy. Furthermore, you write in your book that, quote, the Qing Empire is sometimes portrayed as being ignorant of or fiercely resistant to the imperatives of the new system of Western style international law. However, in the case of Korea, Qing policymakers saw treaties and international law as a useful tool for promoting their own security and commercial interests in Korea, end quote. You make the argument that China forced unequal treaties on Korea, not dissimilar from the way that the Western colonial powers had forced unequal treaties onto China. What did some of these treaties look like and what were their effects? As an extension to this question, you note that like Western colonial powers had done in Qing China, the Qing had also established their own extraterritorial privileges in Korea. Can you also describe what that looked like? Uh, how were disputes mediated? Were there mixed courts in, uh, such as in the international settlement in Shanghai? Okay, uh, a, lo a lot to sort of unpack there. Uh, first, it's important to know that the first sort of supposedly Western style, modern style, unequal treaty that was forced upon Korea was, was done by Japan in 1876, the Treaty of Kanha. Uh, and this gave Japan access to three Korean ports and uh, increasing access to not only the Korean market, but uh, really to, to uh, Korean politics. And uh, the Qing were very worried about this, worried about growing Japanese domination in Korea. And Lee Hong-jong realized that uh, international law and treaties might be a useful tool with which they could counterbalance Japan. And so in 1882, Lee invites the United States and then shortly thereafter Britain and Germany to uh, negotiate treaties with Korea but these were all negotiated by Lee and his assistants in China on behalf of Korea. And uh, the hope was if you get these other powers involved in Korea, then they will, they will counterbalance Japan. But when you look at the actual texts of these treaties, they're remarkably similar. There are a few differences, but they're remarkably similar to the same types of treaties that have been forced upon China and Japan decades earlier. Again, with all the, all the same uh, treaty ports, success, uh, concessions, uh, extraterritoriality, uh, limitations on tariffs, uh, all, all sorts of things like that. And then later in 1882, the Qing goes one step further and negotiates their own treaty with Korea. And this one tried to sort of have its cake and eat it too. On the one hand, it starts out in the preamble saying, Korea has long been a vassal of China, and this is just nothing new, nothing different. But on the other hand, when you look at the actual uh, uh, clauses in this treaty, it's the same sort of thing. China gets treaty ports, self-governing concessions, extraterritoriality, a lower tariff rate than everybody else, uh, uh, just all, all sorts of things that, that again, are, are remarkably similar to what was being done to China and Korea, or, or Japan, excuse me. Extraterritoriality within that is, is a really interesting thing because it what evolves in Korea is, is rather unlike what you see in China. You know, you, re, you refer to mixed courts and, and, and uh, this, this whole sort of administrative apparatus that was designed to administer extraterritoriality. In Korea, it was much more crude. Uh, when, when there were particular issues, basically uh, Qing officials on the ground, most notably Yuan Shikai, would essentially just say, leave it to us, we'll take care of it. Uh, and, and then there wasn't necessarily a set of institutions used to design this or, or to adjudicate this. Uh, and one, I think, really interesting example of this is technically, according to the treaty that, that uh, the Qing and Korea had negotiated between, between each other, uh, Chinese merchants are supposed to stay in the treaty ports. And the only way you could travel outside the treaty ports is if you were issued a passport by the Korean government that said you're allowed to travel 
during this period of time to this place. Uh, Yuan Shikai essentially said, uh, we'll, we'll take care of that. And so he issued these, these travel passports directly to sort of bypassing the, the Korean side of things. Uh, and, and so again, it's, it's much more sort of direct and crude uh, as compared to what you saw in, in the Chinese treaty ports. As an extension of what you'd said, I recently interviewed Alexis Dutton, who wrote about Japan's colonization of Korea. And what she spoke about is how when Japan colonized Korea, the Japanese established that English would be the standard backdrop against which all treaties uh, signed between Japan and Korea would be based if there were any discrepancies between the uh, Korean and, and Japanese versions of the treaty. Similarly, when the British colonized China, the British asserted that English, uh, the English version of all treaties supersede the Chinese version of said treaty whenever there was a dispute pertaining to the wording or phrasing, etc. So when the Chinese were crafting treaties in Korea, did they make a similar assertion that if there was ever a discrepancy between uh, the two versions of a treaty, the Chinese language one would be treated as the official one? So between the various Asian participants in this new diplomacy, uh, this, this pro problem was easily bypassed by the fact that they all were using classical Chinese. And so there weren't necessarily differing versions between, say, China and Korea or Korea and Japan. Uh, there were differing versions between Korea and the West. And, and so you would have usually a classical Chinese version negotiated by the Chinese early on and, and then by Korea a bit later, and then a Western language version. Uh, I'm not aware of too many cases, or maybe if I think about it, any cases where there were significant disputes about perceived differences between the wordings of, of the different language versions of the treaties. And so I, I don't know which would have been given primacy because I'm not, I'm not aware of too many disputes on, on that particular issue. You pointedly note in your book that much of the current Western historiography on China tends to portray China as firmly tied to traditional notions of Chinese politics. You write at one point in your book that, quote, the notion of a unitary Chinese world order has come under growing scrutiny and criticism as it has become increasingly clear that the Qing Empire, not to mention its predecessors, dealt with the myriad of groups, states, and peoples both within the empire itself and beyond in a variety of ways, many of which do not fit within the mold of a Sinocentric tribute system, end quote. So we've already spoken about the approaches to international relations that the Qing had adopted, but I'm curious to know more about the predecessors to the Qing prior to Western colonialism. How did they deal with diverse groups in ways that challenge our conceptualizations that we typically have of China as always using a Sinocentric uh, tributary framework? So I, I think there are two really good examples of this. The first obvious one is the Mongol period, the, the UN. Um, I mean, most of us today would say that, that, that it isn't quite China because it wasn't. But within the traditional Chinese historiography, when you, when you list all the dynasties, the UN just fits there right between the Song and the Ming. And, and very clearly the UN interacted with a variety of people in a variety of ways, uh, nothing looking like the traditional uh, tributary system. Uh, but I think more interesting is, is uh, some more recent work done on the Ming. Uh, and here I'm thinking primarily the work of David Robinson, but, but there are a few others as well. Uh, the, the note, you see some of the same things that the, the new Qing historians had trumpeted about the Qing, about how they, you know, the, the Qing emperors would wear different hats to appeal to different constituencies and peoples along its border. And you find similar things in the Ming, that, that uh, when the Ming are dealing directly with Korea, they often would put on the Confucian hat and say, we're both Confucian. And, and so we'll just do things uh, using that language and that kind of rhetoric. But when they dealt with the nomads, the Mongols to the north, uh, they would invite them to come on imperial hunts with them and, 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 and do other things that you simply didn't see within a supposedly a traditional tributary relationship. Similarly, the Ming had uh, some varied uh, relationships and approaches with Tibet and, and especially Tibetan Buddhist leaders. And so there, I, I think uh, if, if, if Robinson is correct, and I think he is, uh, there might be more continuity between the Ming and the Qing on some of these issues than, than, than we used to recognize uh, or, or acknowledge. So before we wrap up, I, I wanted to talk a bit more broadly about the field of Chinese history in the West. Uh, 
It seems to be a tradition in our field, if you're studying Chinese history, to learn Japanese as a companion language to Chinese. In fact, some graduate programs even make learning Japanese a requirement for scholars of China uh, in order to graduate from that program. This is interesting because despite being geographically closer and also having deep historical ties to China, it seems that most China history graduate programs don't put an emphasis on learning Korean in the same way that they do Japanese. As a result, it seems to me that the China field severely lacks scholarly literature on pre-20th century Sino-Korean history. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on why it is that China history programs often require their students to study Japanese, but not Korean. Why is there such a lack of attention paid to the history of the connection between these two places? Yeah, I mean, I, I would think that some of that is simply the heavy hand of inertia and tradition. Uh, when, when I was doing my graduate work, uh, I was forced to uh, test in a European language, even though, even though my fields of study were, were all China and Korea. So, and, and so I had to learn French. Uh, where, where once upon a time, perhaps that made sense. Uh, now, maybe not so much. Uh, but, but, but I think there's some practical reasons why initially Japan made sense. Uh, Japan had a large, you know, much larger population than Korea, had a longer tradition of having Western style academic and scholarly output. And so there's a, a much greater amount of, of secondary literature in Japanese uh, that, that might be useful for, for a variety of topics. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right that uh, there are many things that Korean scholars can bring to the table, especially in, in the last few decades uh, that, that Chinese uh, scholars or scholars of Chinese history can, can greatly benefit from. And there also is a, a huge repertoire of Korean historical sources. Uh, fortunately, the vast majority of them are compiled in classical Chinese. And so if you're doing Song or Ming history, and you know, you're, you're, you're essentially reading the same kinds of documents. And I'm struck by how often scholars uh, in China, Chinese history writing in Chinese, will just, along with the, the sources that they're, they're looking at in China, will just say, oh, and, and, and here are the, the Korean Kodyosa or the Joseon Wang Shilok says this, uh, because it's, it's quite easily accessible for those that, that can uh, read the classical Chinese. And so, yeah, I, I think that, that uh, Korea has a lot to bring to the table. And I would expect that as, as things move forward, you'll start to see more uh, diversification of what, what that second language should look like if, if you're studying China or, or even East Asia more generally. Dr. Larson, thanks for coming on this episode of the What is Asia podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And for those who want to see more content, you can go to the What is Asia podcast YouTube channel or nakodadefonso.com. We'll see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.